Well, anyway, when we think of fathers from scriptural perspective, we think of maturity. And in scripture, we find that there are basically three levels of maturity or immaturity, if you want to look at it from that point. First John chapter 2, John gives three levels of growth and he gives us little children, young men, and fathers. Now fathers have known the heart of Christ and they reflect the, the heart of the Father. And if you try to find a hallmark virtue for the Father, the word patience pops up quite a few times. Patience. Patience, understanding, compassion, and yet equity. The Father is absolutely just and equitable. Just. But looking at Romans chapter 15, verse, eight, verse 5, <clears throat> he's called the God of patience. God is very patient with us. Appreciated that little prayer this morning there. God gives us a lot of slack, doesn't he? I don't know how many times I, I thought I went past the line and, and God still brought me back in my younger years. Romans chapter 15 and verse 5, it says, Now the God of patience and consolation, actually the word consolation has a sense of guardianship, grants you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. So he's called the God of patience. Now when you think of the father of our faith, Father Abraham, he's also described as having great patience. So let me look at another verse with you here in Hebrews chapter 6. The word patience is always connected to fatherhood. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. It says, when God made promises to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise after he had patiently endured. And we're talking about a 25 year duration from the time that the promise was given till the fulfillment of that promise. When you think of Job also, here's, here's one that pictures fatherhood. I mean, you usually don't think of Job as father figure, but he was one who interceded continually for his children. And in fact, in the end, he produced some of the finest children in the land after the trial was over. But the word that you connect with Job is what? Patience, right? In fact, James, James uses this word quite a few times. For a little book, he uses the word patience, patiently, about nine times. But one of those times, he ascribes patience to Job. James 5.11, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So here is another picture of fatherhood, and again the word patience pops up there. Now, coming into the New Testament, when you think of the Apostle Paul, Paul describes himself as a father. In fact, he says this to the Corinthians, he says, if, if uh, I'm a father to none other, I am to you. Paul was a true father. Paul was one who was compassionate, understanding, and yet he corrected them. He had long patience with them. And in 1 Corinthians 4.15, I mean, here's a big church, maybe 70,000 in its heyday there, maybe 70,000, and he says, but there's only a few fathers in the church. You have 10,000 instructors, 
In 1 Corinthians 15, 4, 15, I'm sorry. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, and they had them, many instructors, many ministries coming through Corinth. Yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So Paul claimed fatherhood to the Corinthian church. These other instructors were allowing all kinds of sins to take place in the church, but Paul dealt with it, didn't he? He was a true father. He was loving. He was kind. And when he describes his apostleship, well, when you think of the apostle, what do you think of? You think of authority, you think of power, you think of miracles and all of that. And yet, I want to show you how he describes his apostleship. So, again, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 12, he says, uh, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? The signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience. And, of course, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds, but he puts patience before anything else, in all patience. And interestingly, this word patience or actually uh, it kind of links with another word, which is called long-suffering, and it's macrothumia. And... Um, they're kind of a, they're not synonymous, but they're linked. Long suffering and patience are kind of linked together. That means that you bear with things. Uh, you put up with things for a long, long time because you have hope for the outcome. <laughs> You're putting up with things for a long, long time because you have hope that things are going to turn out. Maybe you have a promise, but you bear with things for a long, long time. You know, this is not little children, this is not young men, but this is the father who bears with things for a long, long time because he, he sees the end of it, he has hope for the end of it, and so he puts up with a lot in between because he can see something good coming out of it. Amen? Now, when Israel rejected their Messiah, they forfeited all of the blessings that were channeled down through the fathers, from Father Abraham, and those blessings compounded through succeeding fathers that came from Abraham, and they channeled right through Christ. But because they rejected Christ, those blessings of the Father channeled through Christ to the church. In fact, uh, Paul tells us in Romans 9 and 10 that, that these blessings that were transferred over to the church are going to provoke Israel to jealousy. Israel, in the end, sees that the promises that were supposed to be theirs have come to us. And I want to take a look at these promises for a minute. There are seven blessings that were supposed to be theirs, but they were forfeited because of the rejection of uh, the one who came through the line of the fathers, which was Christ. And so in Romans 9, chapter 4, uh, verse 4 and 5, Paul lists seven blessings. <clears throat> And the last one here being fathers. Romans chapter 9, verse 4, he says, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and actually that last one, the seventh one, fathers, uh, in another translation, it reads a little bit better, it says, to them belong the patriarchs, or the fathers. That was part of the, the seven blessings that were given to Israel. And of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. So, 
There were seven blessings that were promised to Israel. The last blessing was the fathers. The blessing of the fathers and that blessing, they lost it, it was transferred over to the church. Now, Israel is kind of like the prodigal. They, they lose their inheritance. And yes, they're restored in the end, but they've lost their inheritance. And the true inheritance comes over to the church. Now, you can see this in other places in scripture where Saul, for example, he's a figure of Israel after the flesh. He, he loses the anointing. The anointing transfers over to David, who is a type of the church. And Saul is provoked to jealousy, isn't he? Because David has what he was supposed to have. That's how it's going to work in the end. Because there is a great blessing coming to the church of the last days. And it's going to provoke Israel as well. Or, am I making that clear to you? So, Abraham's blessings are mine. I can claim Abraham's blessings going right back to Abraham and through the fathers because it all connects through Christ. All of those blessings came down, channeled through Christ, and those who believe in Christ can connect back to Abraham. We can legitimately say Abraham's blessings are mine. So there was a compounded blessing being passed down through Abraham's seed, right through Christ and to us. And, uh, you know, this is a little bit what I want to talk about before we conclude here. Because the Lord has promised us a certain blessing, and we want to grow into the maturity where we can pass that blessing on to our spiritual seed or natural seed as well. Amen. Looking at another verse in Galatians. Galatians 3.14. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We can connect. We can connect right back to Father Abraham through Christ because he was the promised seed, and those who believe in Christ can connect right back. And so the blessing of the fathers, that was part of the promise to Israel, that all of the blessings of the fathers were to them, but because they rejected the connecting point, <laughs> they rejected Christ, all of those promises were transferred over to the church. Yes, Israel is going to be restored, but they have lost the inheritance. The real inheritance comes over to the church, and of course there was a remnant of Jews that are a part of the church as well. Amen? So, um, we are recipients of the Father's blessings, and Israel is going to be provoked in the end when they see that the church has what they should have had. So, we're recipients of that. In fact, the compounded blessing, not only from the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament as well. They're passed down, and they're passed down to us, and we as fathers, as spiritual leaders, want to pass on that blessing to our offspring, natural or spiritual. In fact, you know, these, these patriarchs, the early, the younger patriarchs, they coveted the Father's blessing, didn't they? And... They were compounded blessings. I don't know if I had that reference there or not, but uh, maybe we'll look at it in a minute. But the compounded blessings were passed down to us. Now, if you remember back a year ago today, we were paying tribute to one of the, the greatest spiritual fathers of our time. It was on Father's Day when we were paying tribute and honoring the, the founder of this fellowship. And he was one of the greatest examples of a father who never had any natural children, but he had 
thousands of spiritual children. So we were conducting his funeral a year ago on Father's Day. And you know, he left us something. Uh, he left us a blessing that we can't really measure. I mean, we can't calculate what he gave to us naturally and spiritually. Now, I'd mentioned once to members of the church that going back when we first got this building, you know, we needed some money and uh, we were going to borrow it, you know, to fix things up. And Dr. Bailey said to me, how much you need? Well, I said, well, you know, I need about 92000 And he said, well, I'll give it to you, interest-free. You can pay me back, you know, when you want to. I, I don't know if I've told this publicly before or not, but... And, and I thought, oh, I don't want to take $92,000. I don't want to take this. He insisted that I take this 92000 Okay, so he gave us 92000 for the restoration work in the building and so on. And then, over the course of time, we paid back about 50000 of that amount. And, and then we hit a lull here where we weren't really making some payments to, to Pastor Bailey, Dr. Bailey. And so I was feeling a little bit grieved about it because it went on for a little time where we didn't make a payment. And so I wrote him a letter and I said, Pastor Bailey, I said, you know, we've only paid 50000 of the amount that you gave to us and we're in a little lull right now. And I said, uh, I want you to know we have every intention. We're going to pay this back in full. And I just, I just didn't want you to think that we forgot or anything like that. Immediately, he called me up on the phone. He said, Dan, he said, you know, I forgot all about it. Anyway, he says, I completely forgot about it. I want you to know that the debt is forgiven right now. It's, it's, he said, it's, it's forgiven. So he sent me a letter, you know, in writing saying the debt was totally forgiven. You know, that's $42,000 worth. But, I mean, that was him. That was Dr. Bailey. He was... A father naturally to us, I mean, and the natural things, and of course, in the spiritual, how can we measure it? I think of all the men that I, I've known here and far through my short life, and I don't think there's anybody that connected with the fathers of yesteryear like this man did. I mean, he saw them in the spirit, he imitated them. And he passed down a blessing that was awesome. I mean, he passed on a prophetic teaching mantle to this fellowship that is rare. Now, my challenge today is, of course, to men and fathers. If we're going to pass down a mantle or a blessing, then we must mature into the image that was given to us. <laughs> And even go beyond that so that we can pass a blessing on to our offspring. Naturally speaking, our children, natural children and spiritual children. Now, I mentioned to you that the blessing of God compounds over the generations. And that, that works both ways, good and evil. Because the evil seed, the tares become more and more wicked the righteous seed becomes more and more righteous and everything is going to, you know, flourish here at the end and be quite defined as we reach the end of this age. Now, I'm reading a verse in Genesis 49. Genesis 49. This is Jacob. He's passing on a blessing to Joseph, who really wasn't in line for the blessing. He was number 11 in the line. In the, in the lineup, uh, the blessing was supposed to go to the firstborn, but uh, Jacob saw things differently. And this is what he says. This is Genesis 49:26. Genesis 49, 26. Genesis 49, 26. 
The blessings of thy father, he's referring to himself, have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. His blessing exceeded what his fathers were. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. So Jacob prevailed to a greater degree, had a greater blessing than his progenitors, and he is passing that down onto the head of Joseph. So the point is, there is a compounded blessing that we receive from our fathers, fathers that things that they have learned and experienced, they've passed them on to us. And if we can, you know, if we can take hold of some of the things that our fathers have taught us, it saves us a lot of grief in life. If, if we can see the mistakes that they've made and, uh, and learn from that, it saves us from making the same mistakes and we can pass on something even beyond what we receive to our, to our children. And we want to be able to do that as fathers. Amen? We want to pass something on that's very good to our children, naturally and spiritually. And these patriarchs, they coveted that blessing. You remember the contention between Jacob and Esau. You know, they wanted that blessing. And my wife grew up with a, well, the pastor's son in the church and young people's group at the time. Um, and he told me this story. His father was the pastor of the church, but his father took him on a little fishing trip. It was his father and son. They went up into the Adirondacks fishing. And, and while they were up there, uh, the son says to his father, he said, Father, would you lay your hands on me and bless me? And, of course, his father, Brother Faye, right? laid hands on his son and prayed for him. And this pastor, he's probably in his 70s now, but he said that was the greatest blessing that he had ever received in his life from his father. See, we want to be able to do that. And you know something? We can only impart what we are and what we have. You know, I've had people ask me to impart certain things to them, especially on the mission field. You know, they think that you have everything. But really, you can only really impart what you have. If you have a teaching mantle and you can impart that to people if you know you're in sync with the spirit. If you have a prophetic mantle you can impart that if you have it. If you're in sync with the spirit. But we want to be able to impart a blessing to our offspring. I I find in scripture at least three places where the Heavenly Father spoke audibly to Christ. And in each instance, there was an increase of authority and anointing when he did that. I mean, when he comes to age 30, Christ, in the Jordan, the Heavenly Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, and of course, the seven spirits of God anointing comes on him in the river. And then you see again on the Mount of Transfiguration, or he speaks concerning his beloved son, hear ye him. And there's a greater authority that comes upon him. They come down from the mountain. And of course, they cast out a demon that the disciples down below can't. But I mean, the point is there was a, a greater deposit of the anointing and that second blessing. And then I find one other. I mean, if there's another one that I'm missing or... You'll have to let me know, but I see again in, in John 12, 28, where he's saying, Father, glorify, you know, thy name. And, and the Father speaks from heaven, and they think it's thunder. And, uh, and the Lord says, I've glorified it, and I will yet glorify it. And you see that this final installment, if we could say, of the anointing was preparing him for the cross. And so... You know, he glorifies the Son again in this third time he speaks. So, you know what I'm saying is there's a blessing that comes down from, from the Father. And we want to be able to do that. Okay, I want to consider just a few more aspects of Father virtue. 
And we see it portrayed in the story of the prodigal. I'm not going to go through the whole story here, but you know, Christ portrays the father's heart in this story, father nature, as one who exhibits great patience and compassion and understanding. I mean, he reconciles brethren here. And yet, he is very just and equitable. And I think Christ is giving us a picture of what the Father's Spirit is all about. And so you find the account, of course, in Luke 15. And the one son is saying, Father, give me. <laughs> and uh, the Father complies. And, you know, it's not as though the Father... You have to read between the lines. I mean, you see the Heavenly Father in this. It's not as though the Father doesn't know what the Son is going to do with this inheritance, but he says, give me. Okay. This son has to go out and really blow his life away almost before he comes to himself and he comes back and says, make me, <laughs> make me a servant. You know, In the beginning he's saying, give me, but in his repentance he comes back and says, make me a servant. And you know, the unfortunate thing is that some people can only be redeemed after they wreck their lives. You know, that's an unfortunate truth, and God knows that. He knows that the only way that they're going to come to him is after they have ruined their lives, messed up, you know, and, and uh, in an almost irreparable sort of way. <laughs> and it's at that point that they're going to turn around and, and repent. So the father patiently is waiting for them to do this. Now this is not to the lost sinner, folks. You understand that, don't you? This is to somebody who's in the household of faith. And this sinner who, this uh, son who wants all of his inheritance, now he gets it and he goes out and he does exactly what his father knew he was going to do. Put some hair here. And let me give you another verse here. Uh, you don't have to turn, but just to give us a picture of the Father's heart who is waiting for things to correct. In 1 Peter 3.20, here's the heart of the Father. It says, uh, going back to the days of Noah, which sometime were disobedient. There were a lot of disobedience at that time. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, and that could have been about a hundred year span of time. But it says uh, the long suffering of God, and that's that word comes up again, macrothumia, which means patient. So he's he's waiting, <laughs> he's giving them plenty of opportunity to get straightened out, isn't he? During this time period, he's, he's waiting patiently for them. And God wants man to correct. It doesn't mean they're going to, but he gives them every chance to. And he finally comes to himself in the pig pen. He couldn't get any lower than that. You know, I remember once uh, in Guatemala, we went down to a it's actually an old Spanish town in the mountains. It's, Guatemala is very hilly, you know, maybe 8,000, 9,000 feet where we were at. And we went to this uh, little town called Antigua. A lot of tourists go there. It's actually a pretty spooky town. Dark Catholicism, cobblestone streets. You know, you're going back for over 400 years. And this pastor had a dump, uh, dump. <laughs> he had a... He had a church outside the dump of the city. He was right on the, I mean, he was right on the, on the edge of the city dump. And so you're going there at night, and it was a clear night, and it was frosty. You know, you're up in the mountains, and um, there were people in the dump burning garbage to keep warm, and even the dogs were kind of sitting in a circle. It looked like they were going through some kind of a seance or something. You know, they're 
gaunt, skinny dogs, you know. And, and I said to the pastor afterwards, I said, uh, I said, uh, why don't you go out and try to get some of these people in the dump to come into the church? He said to me, he said, would you believe this? He said, we have. He said, a good share of these people out there in the dump were once Pentecostal ministers that had, you know, gone the hard way, and here they were at the, as low as you can get, you know, the pig pen. Looking at Luke 15, we'll be done here in a minute. Luke 15, 18 through 20, uh, the, the prodigal sees himself for what he really is. He finally comes to himself. He sees himself as the wretched person that he has allowed himself to become. And he says in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Understand, there is repentance here. And am no worthy... Uh, no more worthy to be called thy son, make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Uh, this little phrase kind of struck me, when he was a great way off. And I think, you know, the heavenly father Here's the, the eyes of the father who sees the prodigal a great way off sitting in the pig pen. And, you know, he's on his way to meet this son. Now, he was a distant little figure coming down the road, and he knew it was his son coming home. I mean, that's the heart of the father. Because he, he's, he, is, he understands mankind. He understands human frailty. He's filled with compassion. He runs out, falls on the neck of this son coming home, and his father, his son is very repentant and saying, Father, just make me a servant. I'm, I've sinned against you. I've disgraced your name. I've, I've ruined my life. And, and the father wants to restore him. I mean, it, it, it's a beautiful story. Um, but we're talking about father virtues. He never says a word about where he's been or what he's done or anything like that. He, he knows what he's done. And as we said, he also knows there's been heartfelt repentance. The father's rejoicing. He restores to him the robe of righteousness the ring, which speaks of authority, the shoes, which speak of ministry, he's restored. Uh, his father makes a feast for him and so on. And then he understands the heart of the other son who's been faithful. The other son's kind of tiffed. He's angry because, you know, he's been faithful. There's not been any, you know... Nobody threw a party for him, but he understands that, doesn't he? I mean, we're looking at father virtues, and so the father understands the heart of the other son. And verse 28 through 30, the son is angry and would not go into this reception to this party. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet there was never given me a kid, roast kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. So here again the father spirit understands the feelings of his son. But you see how he responds here, the father. You see how just and equitable he really is. 
going on to verse 31, 32, and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. All that I have is thine. Everything is yours. You know, we win Christ, we win everything. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He said, Son, come in and let's rejoice because everything is yours. Your brother blew his inheritance away. We're happy he's restored. We're happy he's back in the home. But everything that I have goes to you. So the father, with his patience and compassion and understanding of everything else, is very fair and very equitable as well. See, that's the father's heart, isn't it? Patient, long-suffering, compassionate. And yet, there's mercy and justice there, too. The Lord wants to reach out and save people, and yet he does not pardon the unrepentant. Now, as I said uh, last year to this day, we paid tribute to a man that was a great spiritual father. And I had written a, a book on Abraham back, uh, I don't know, maybe 14 years ago. I'm not sure, 12 years ago or something like that. And in the end of the, in the, at the very end of the book, I made a little tribute to Pastor Bailey. And I always thought in my heart, if, if he ever dies, I'm going to read this tribute at his funeral, which that's how it turned out. I read that little tribute. But I'm going to read it again. It's only two paragraphs. That was on Father's Day. How apropos. A tribute. After studying the life of Father Abraham, I've come to appreciate even more my own spiritual father, who is not just my spiritual father, but a father of nations and kings. And if you knew him, he ministered in over a hundred countries. His influence and faithfulness upon the earth has literally kept the church of our day on course. In my opinion, and I'm not alone, Reverend Brian Bailey is the greatest man of our generation. He has imparted to us, his sons, the key of knowledge and the personal example by which to gauge our lives. You know, we have an awesome legacy, really. Somebody who passed on something that can't be measured. And, you know, that's our challenge today to fathers. We have an image that we want to conform to and even exceed by the grace of God so that we can impart a legacy to our offspring that will forever change them and cause them to do the same. Amen. Amen, fathers.